Mark Carden. I'm uh, the Assistant National Secretary in the uh, Rail Maritime Transport Workers Union in the UK. And okay, yeah, okay. So, Mark, uh, why don't we talk first about the effect of privatization in the railway system here? One time, the national railways were uh, quite good; they were efficient. What, what's happened to the railway system in Britain? Well, in 1994, under the John Major Conservative government, uh, it was privatised, uh, and franchises were given out under the guise of competition. Twenty odd years later, there is no competition. There's just monopolies. Uh, unfortunately, the franchises are now mainly owned by foreign state railways. Uh, the French state railway own a, own a franchise. Uh, the Spanish state railway own a franchise. The German state railway own a couple of franchises, and the Dutch uh, railway state railway own a franchise as well. And they're open, they're quite open when they uh, take their accounts back to Holland. Uh, they tell their shareholders that they are taking money out of the, the British railway system and improving the Dutch railway system. So they're taking British taxpayers' money to, back to Holland to invest in their railways and to uh, lower fares at the expense of, of British commuters. Uh, the ideological argument is, is now beginning to waver because people are getting fed up uh, with above inflation uh, ticket prices and cramp, cramped trains uh, where you can't get a seat and you're paying thousands of pounds uh, in season tickets uh, to get to work. There was a, a study which said that, uh, the average worker now who commutes by rail uh, pays up to 10% of their income in, uh, in ticket prices which is, I believe, 7% more than uh, the European continent. And the effect on health and safety and maintenance as a result of privatization, has there been a radical effect? Yes, I believe so. Uh, I, I can put you in touch with our health and safety guy, uh, and he'll, he'll tell you how much maintenance is backed up. Uh, it's all, it's all uh, outsourced by Network Rail, to subcontractors, so if somebody doesn't uh, do their part of the maintenance, it backs up to the next person, the next person, and they can't do their maintenance periods. But it's getting really, really critical now, uh, where health and safety uh, is being compromised, we believe, uh, and, and we've got evidence to support that. And the effect on railroad workers as far as stress and, and other issues, I mean, is there a concern uh, for your membership about what's happening with privatization? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, the ultimate, I think, of this Conservative government is just to have drivers on trains. But the responsibility on the driver just becomes enormous. Uh, if there's an evacuation or even more serious, you know, a collision, uh, the driver's on his own. You know, he's got to clear the train. But what if the driver's incapacitated? You know, it's a free-for-all then. You've got passengers getting off trains, walking on live lines, uh, you know, encouraging other people to get off trains when we all know uh, you should stay on board until the rescue services arrive. But yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a big concern, big concern. And the development of, of your train system here, the, uh, do you have bullet trains in, in Britain? Uh, no, no. Uh, I've been on the bullet train over in, in Japan. It must uh, irk you. You're, the rest of the world, you've got these yeah. advanced trains and yet in Britain where the rail industry started. Well that, that's totally correct you know uh, I lived in France for a, a couple of years and I went and used their TGV system which is similar to Bullet. Uh, over two years commuting from Calais to Bordeaux every week uh, one, one train was late over two years but they had uh, two guards on each train uh, they were well-manned stations, uh, well-staffed stations. So if you invest in people and the railway system, you get a better, better railway system for the, for the customer. And the situation in Britain, I was just at a, a rally uh, to defend the uh, National Health Service. How are the conditions for the British working class at this point? Well... With the austerity measures uh, which have been rolled out by this Conservative government, uh, 
they raised the retirement age for both men and women. At what age now? Uh, it's, it's incremental. Uh, in, in five years' time, it will be 67 for, for men and I think 65 for women. But then that's going to go up to 70. So people are going to be re uh, working longer, uh, which means if you look back in time when people used to work because they're uh, long because they had no pensions, uh, you more or less retired and died soon afterwards with no quality of life in, in your old age. I believe my father and my grandfather's fought for pensions, uh, decent pensions for, for ordinary people like dockers uh, and public sector workers so they could retire with dignity. Uh, but this government uh, are, are taking the taxpayers of this country uh, into the abyss uh, as, as far as uh, retirement's concerned. It's, it's work longer, work harder, and for a, for a worse pension. And in the United States, for the last 20 or 30 years, there's been a decline in real income. It used to be one man could support his family, now his wife works and his kids have to work, you know, in uh, many different jobs. How is uh, the situation as far as uh, the real income of British workers uh, changed? Well, uh, Prime Minister May coined the phrase uh, just about managing, and it's, it, the, the papers call it jam. And maybe it'll be jammed tomorrow because, you know, the people who've got decent salaries are struggling. If you've got a combined salary, you're still struggling. And, uh, and people are just getting fed up, you know. Uh, we were on de decent money and decent terms and conditions, but they're working harder and the, the wages are, are worth less. Uh, price of food's gone up by 10, 10 to 13%. Uh, petrol... Uh, gas, as you say, has gone up. Uh, the cost of travel has gone up. So the wages should incrementally keep in pace. But what I've experienced is most of the employers I deal with are not given rate of inflation pay increases. They're all below the rate of inflation, which is effectively a pay cut because you're not keeping up with the rate of inflation, which is the cost of living. And... The London has a lot of billionaires, a lot of wealth, and uh, is, what is the effect of gentrification on your members and housing costs for working class people? Well, people can't afford to live in London, ordinary, ordinary people, and, and when Boris Johnson was, was mayor, he decided uh, not to do anything about it. Uh, what, what we call land banking in, in this country, your billionaires and your multimillionaires buy the properties in London, Nobody lives in them because they bought them for one reason, and that's to keep hold of them, land banking, and then sell them on a, a, at a profit at a later date. But there's thousands and thousands of properties uh, without people living in them, but there's a housing crisis in this city of London. Uh, there's not enough social housing. Uh, we we all seen the horrific pictures of Grenfell Tower. Uh, this is the way... Well, what happened in Grenfell Tower? What was that all about? That was a cheap cladding on the outside of the building. Uh, Insulation. Yeah, yeah, basically, but the, the fundamental uh, flaws were there, there was gaps, and anybody who knows how fire works, if it's got a, a gap, it's got a flume, and it's, it's got oxygen. So if it's got oxygen, it creates more fire. Uh, if they would have put uh, inflammable uh, on the outside of the building, uh, cladding, that they would have saved lives. But for the sake of, I think it was, uh, it was like £50,000 uh, between the two bids. They went for the cheaper bid. And this was in the, the richest borough in this country, which is the Royal Borough of Kensington. But those people you're talking about, the billionaires, they live on one side of Kensington and keep the... the, uh, the I won't say... Well, I will say they think scum out of the way and in the cheap areas. And were you shocked at what happened there, the death of, of all these people? And yeah, you know, when you live in, a, in a, a country that's supposed to be, you know, leaders in health and safety and, and a, you know, social fairness, uh, and then, you know, 70 people die in a, in a tower and inferno, that could have been prevented. You know, it's absolutely shocking. And has anyone been held accountable? Has anyone gone to jail for that? Uh, there's going to be there's going to be an inquiry. Uh, a few people have resigned from 
uh, Kensington Council. But nobody's been arrested. Uh, there's been no criminal charges brought against anybody. Uh, the inquiry might might bring those charges, but as we found out with uh, the Hillsborough disaster, uh, when 96 football fans died, it took 30 years to get justice. Uh, eventually we got justice and, and now people are being uh, criminally prosecuted, i.e. the police, whose fault it was. But that's took 30 years. We can't afford Grenfell to, to uh, be kicked into the long grass. Too many people died. Now, the unions have come under attack here. They've been blamed for inefficiency. They've been kind of scapegoated. Is that still going on? Is there a backlash to that? And are unions growing in Britain? Yeah, the, our union is, is growing. Uh, we're, we're quite good at our recruitment. Uh, other unions are amalgamating, so the, the combining members. But it's hard to get over to the younger people uh, what unions are about. I think that they're starting to, to realise now that unions are there to help people. Whereas the right wing press uh, demonises, you know, as a left wing uh, lunatics who, who, who want to uh, nationalise everything. But all we're saying is, you know, nationalisation and public ownership of railways or our hospitals or our schools is, is not a bad thing. And people are now getting the results of this privatisation. So the, there's a lot of unhappiness about it. Yeah, yeah, you know, uh, we've had a, a massive failure of a uh, company called Carillion. Well, why don't you talk about Carillion, what it is and what happened? Well, Carillion was a massive, massive uh, outsourcing company which uh, looked after lots of government projects. They've got lots of their fingers in lots of pies. They uh, run prisons, build houses, build estates, build office buildings, build hospitals, build schools. They maintain them at, at inflated prices also. Uh, and what happened was uh, they overcapitalized, and uh, for a company of that size, uh, they left themselves with a small cash flow. And then when everybody started to call in the debts, they never had uh, they never had the money to pay them. They made three profit warnings in 2017, but the government still kept on giving them public contracts. So you know the government knew they were in trouble but still started giving them public contracts in hospitals and schools. And now it's collapsed. There's thousands of people who don't know whether they've got a job next week or the week after. But it was, a, it was a, 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 an example of how outsourcing shouldn't work. But this Carillion uh, is the thin end of the wedge, we believe. You know, there's other companies like Serco who were involved in outsourcing. Very, very good at bidding for these... Uh, these companies and franchises, but not very good at running them. Now, privatization has also led to corruption. Uh, politicians are given money by companies, by billionaires, and then they get uh, privatized properties. Is there a growth of corruption in, in Britain and uh, relationship between the politicians and these privatizers? Well, there's, there's constant stories of politicians getting caught out. Uh, there was an example last week where three politicians were selling their, uh, selling their wares for thousands of pounds a day to represent uh, Chinese companies. Well, they, they were bogus Chinese companies because they were reporters, but they were prepared to sell themselves uh, to these Chinese companies to, to have an, uh, a say in Brexit. And, you know, Brexit is a very difficult... Uh, very, very difficult negotiation, but it's got to be in the, in the interests of the public, not in the interests of a few politicians and a few companies. It's got to be in the interests of the public of the UK. Now, your union uh, supported Brexit and uh, arguing that, uh, that Brexit, the, the European Union, the European community were actually requiring deregulation and privatization. Uh, what is the state now and uh, has there been a backlash blaming immigrants? I mean, the, the capitalists have blamed the immigrants, minorities, for the economic crisis. Is that continuing? Yes, yes, and, you know, that's the, that's the lies that uh, the right-wing press peddle, that immigrants are uh, to blame for austerity. Well, I know that is not true because it was the bankers, but if it's fed and fed and fed and drip-fed, drip-fed, you know, people, some people, ignorant people, do believe it. Uh, but, yeah, you know, Brexit 
we 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 uh, campaigned to come out of Europe because there was too many unelected bureaucrats there, and yet you know their their policy was uh, neoliberalism. Uh, everybody gets a bite of the cherry, but it doesn't seem to be working that way. And you know, uh, with the upsurge of Jeremy Corbyn and uh, John McDonnell, uh, we believe another way is possible. And there have been increasing tax in the United States on immigrants, rise of racism, xenophobia. What has the RMT done to fight to defend immigrants and minorities? Well, a lot of our members uh, are minorities, immigrants, uh, people who've just come you know, from war-torn areas to, to have a peaceful life, you know, uh, a job with some dignity uh, and, and do a proper job. So. It's a falsity for these papers, these right-wing papers, to say that they're to blame. I think there's a stat, uh, statistic that says 95% of immigrants who come into this country actually work. They don't sponge off the state. They work and they contribute and they spend money for the economy. Uh, so, yeah, you know, it's uh, probably 5% that, that don't work, but you're probably talking a couple of thousand people or 10,000 people. The rest of them work and contribute to the country and then contribute to the economy. Now, your prime minister was uh, trying to make uh, f have a good relationship with uh, President Trump. First of all, what do you think about President Trump? Were you surprised that he became president of the United States? Uh, very surprised. You know, I've, I've, I've seen him on TV. Uh, very gregarious person. I think he, I think he's trying to run America like a business. But you can't, you know, it's it's just too big, and uh, hopefully the people won't won't let him. But I think he's he's hit a spot, the same as over here, uh, where the establishment have got to be questioned. I think he's doing it in the wrong way. Uh, I hear there was uh, there was a there was a phrase, anyone but Clinton, ABC. I think Bernie Sanders would have been a better uh, president. He would have been more inclusive. Uh, than Donald Trump. Donald Trump just divides people. And the the rise of uh, right wing fascist uh, and uh, Nazis, neo Nazis. The, some of these billionaires are giving them money. Are are you concerned? Is your union concerned about the danger of a of a rise of a real right wing fascistic movement? Yeah, yeah. But it's you know it, it, it's obvious that it's going on in, in America. Uh, it's going on in Europe as well. You know, there's a polarisation, the, the right are becoming either further right, but then, uh, you know, the left are trying to get on, on, onto the mainstream of politics. But we had an incident in, in Italy this weekend where there was a drive-by shooting of immigrants, you know, and, the, you know, that, that, was, that was shocking as well, where somebody just thinks they can drive past immigrants and, and, and start shooting them. And... Um the question of internationalism, the unions um, need to have more internationalism. They're fighting the same companies all over the world. How do you see the development of building an international trade union movement that can actually be a fighting trade union movement to defend workers around the world? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. You know, I always believe in more internationalism. The, the world is a smaller place. I think the first time I met you, you, know, uh, you were the first ones to do blogs and stuff like that. That was 10 years ago. But, uh, you know, there's more communication to be done, uh, which is easier said than done. But we have, you know, we have the ITF, International Transport Workers Federation, which is an umbrella organisation for all transport workers around the world. But we're still being attacked. You know, our comrades down under in Australia are currently in the courts uh, over jumped-up charges of, uh, of uh, industrial action. Which, which was unofficial, and, the, and the, I believe they're paying millions of dollars uh, to Chevron, which is the company that's uh, suing the MUA. But we, we will do everything we can to help. You know, uh, they support us when we have our, have our uh, demonstrations against Macquarie Bank, who own Condor Ferries in this country. Uh, but Macquarie Bank are just an investment bank that invests in infrastructure, uh, they 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 uh, take all the profits out, uh, asset strip it, and then sell it on again. They, all they do is all they do is service the debt, and then they pass it on. 
And the question of, uh, there has been a, a, a left-wing turn in the United States. There are millions of young people now who consider themselves socialist. Many of them supported Bernie Sanders. And uh, also the, the growth of uh, Jeremy Corbyn. How do you look at uh, what is happening politically, that there is a, seems to be a growing left-wing movement uh, in the United States and, and uh, United Kingdom? Well, that, that was great to see. You know, uh, Bernie Sanders uh, mobilizing that many young people. And I think it, it reflected in Jeremy Corbyn and, and, and his success uh, because every th everybody thought he was going to get annihilated when, when Theresa May called an election. Uh, but he, he actually did really well. But he, he, he touched into what Bernie Sanders touched into, which was young people saying, what have I got to look forward to? Because the, the, most of the wealth is in 1% of the hands. Most of the world's wealth is in 5% of the hands of, of, of a small amount of people. So seeing Bernie Saunders and the, and, and the crowds he was getting uh, was an inspiration for, for, for this country. And hopefully we can, we can build on it. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn touched on uh, abolition of student fees. You know, I've, I've got my children potentially going to university and they will come out of university with a forty to fifty thousand pound debt. They're, they're paupers, in other words. Young people go to college and they end up uh, having to spend the rest of their lives trying to pay off the money they owe. Yeah, yeah. You know what? What, what kind of start in life is that? You know, where you start off with a with a with a massive debt. But my father always said to me, uh, the banks have got one, one, uh, one issue, and that's you you control the debt, you control the person. And uh, Jeremy Corbyn has said he's going to renationalize the railways, and he, in fact, was caught on a, on a train without any seat, and, you know, he purchased. Why don't you talk about that incident? Uh, well, the, the company Virgin East Coast uh, said, that, said there was seats uh, and showed through CCTV that there was seats. However, I've traveled many times on that East Coast main line, and they're all reserved. They've all got tickets on the back of the seats, and they're reserved. There's only one coach that is not reserved. So they would have been a bit selective uh, showing empty seats because those seats are reserved. And if they're reserved, you're not going to sit in somebody's seat because, you know, that person turns up, you've just got to get out of his seat. And, you know, it was a bit of a, a media frenzy on it. But, you know, I can assure you, I've travelled on, on that uh, East Coast main line and those seats are reserved. So uh, as a result of... Uh the conditions on the trains, has that led to increased uh, road use or people using cars and that kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. Uh, there was another study uh, last week was, and they were saying uh, railways, because the ticket prices go up every year, have been disadvantaged uh, because fuel duty uh, has not gone up. Uh, there's been no tax increases on petrol. So they're being forced off the trains onto the roads. Uh, because they can't afford the, the fares, and uh, you know the, 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 the train commuters are bearing the brunt of uh, of, the, of travel in this country. And the rise of uh, platforms like Uber, Lyft, uh, in the Bay Area, thousands of uh, workers come in to to drive. It's uh, destroying the taxi industry. Uh, regular taxi workers are being driven out. What is the situation in, in Britain as far as Uber and, and platforms like that? Well, it's exactly the same because, you know, at the end of the day, it is a franchise, you know, and they, they operate in this country the way they operate in America. Uh, they are a transport company. And I think uh, in Spain, they've just won a, a court case to say Uber are a transport employer where they say they're part of the gig economy. So that's an excuse for them to avoid uh, the the liabilities because they employ people. Uh, they should be given them decent terms and conditions. They should be given them paid holidays. Uh, so yeah, it's it's exactly the same franchise uh, rollout as, as in the States. But there's no level playing field uh, for, for other taxi drivers who pay uh, for the licenses through uh, the councils, which can be very expensive. Uh, and Uber drivers don't have to uh, because they're not actually classed as, as, as a transport workers, they're classed as self-employed. And your members who are taxi cab workers have been fighting them and fighting to defend the taxi cab industry here. What, what's been the experience with that? Well, in London, uh, 
they with, withdrew the Uber license to operate taxis uh, because of the model Uber was trying to uh, roll out. Uh, as you know, this city is very famous for, for black cabs, and they've demonstrated many times uh, on go slows, you go 20 miles an hour around London, there's going to be some kickback and uh, there's going to be some uh, traffic congestion. Uh, personally, you know, they, they should, again, have a coordinated approach, I think, around the world. Maybe if all the major cities, London, Paris, New York, uh, Sydney, Singapore, uh, you know, if they all went slow on one day, uh, you know, it, it'd make more news. But, yeah, you know, it's a, it's, it's a company that escapes its responsibilities by saying we don't employ anybody. Now, uh, the technology, uh, artificial intelligence, automation, um, these uh, developments uh, threaten the livelihood of millions of workers. If they automate trucks, if they automate cars, they automate uh, the uh, ships. Um, what is the future for the working class in this kind of society when you have automation that could throw tens of millions or even hundreds of millions of workers out of their jobs. Yeah, yeah, you know, we've, we've seen automation come in pretty heavy on, on the docks uh, and thousands of jobs have been lost f uh, for dockers uh, because there's just automation and, you know, we, we can understand technology and the technology becoming better, but we've got to work with the technology, physically got to work with the technology. When, once you start introducing driverless trains, cars, ships it's just an accident waiting to happen and uh, do you think that technology is going to benefit the working class your members and the working class when it's under the control really of the capitalists who basically want to use it to further exploit workers and make more profits yeah i think the te technology is okay in the house <laughs> you know where uh, the luxuries and benefits of making you you know your house a bit warm and a bit more hospitable but in the workplace you know there's got to be a balance uh, and, and everybody's got everybody's everybody's got to you know uh, got to make some uh, money off it, or and that includes the workers. And I mean, are there protection for workers when there's automation in Britain? I mean, is there any protection? Because if, uh, like tellers, say the uh, uh, there's department stores or clerks now, you're getting rid of clerks. It's all automated. It seems like the jobs, even the McDonald's. Uh, these workers, fast food workers, who are trying to organize, they're faced also with automation. Yeah, it, you know, you see, it, you see it in every railway station now. There's machines, and uh, a lot of railway stations are closing, and there's just machines. But you know, our, our sort of responsibility as a society is to protect the public. So we want to see railway stations kept open uh, and not automated, and that is for the benefits of uh, the public, you know, because if, if something happens or somebody's attacked, there's somebody on site who, who can deal with it. We've seen it in the London Underground where uh, a couple of people have, have, have been killed in stations because there's been nobody there to, uh, to monitor them uh, mainly, but then if something does happen, to go to their rescue. And where is your union politically at this point? Uh, you formed a, or you supported a, another party. You're not in the Labour Party. Are you thinking about changing that? And what's your perspective as far as the political situation in Britain? Well, there's a, a debate going on within the union at the moment, uh, whether we reaffiliate to the Labour Party. Uh, we always send our cheque every year to the Labour Party, but it comes back the next day. Uh, so we so want you've been banned from the Labour Party too, like others, or uh, yes, yes, yes. How, how did that happen? Well, in in the Labour Party rules, uh, you're only allowed to back a Labour Party candidate. Uh, when Bob Crow was our general secretary, we decided to back other candidates who supported our core values of renationalisation of the railways uh, and other transport systems. Uh, which was against the rules uh, after an inquiry, and uh, we were unaffiliated, to put it nicely. But we were one of the founding unions of the Labour Party, and uh, you know it's it's important that we still keep our links. Jeremy Corbyn's uh, obviously come a bit further over to the left uh, for our views to be uh, to be listened to, but it's a it's a debate the unions having at the minute, and uh, there's, there's been no decisions up to now. 
And in the United States, there's a lot of anger about the Democrats, and that's one of the reasons Trump got uh, elected. A lot of uh, even workers said, I'm fed up with the Democrats, NAFTA, everything the Democrats are pushing. You see the development of a, of a labor party, a workers' party in the United States, uh, so that working people have a political alternative? I, th I think there should be, you know, and uh, they should just come out and call it a Labour Party, you know, uh, a party for the workers, for the working classes, uh, because, you know, in America it's important, you know, to have uh, freedom, but it's also important to have, you know, fairness, and uh, it doesn't seem to me that as though the workers get a good deal. I know uh, they don't get many holidays over there, it's not in law, but it's in, it's in law here, you, you've got to have 28 days holiday. And that's just about a work-life balance. You know, uh, you, you, you work hard, so, you know, you need to have a rest. Uh, but, yeah, I'd, I'd like to see a Labour Party in America, but a, a proper, proper socialist Labour Party. Well, they, the uh, capitalists would call that socialism, to have 28 days off a year. Yeah. In fact, that's they accuse uh, Sanders of being a socialist for free medical care, uh, free education, and free child care. Um, there's a, a, an effort in the United States with the Democrats to blame the Russians, to blame Putin uh, for uh, controlling the United States, for controlling the elections. What do you look at this uh, Russian bashing, really, that's going on in the United States? Where do you think that's coming from? Well, first of all, I think, I th I think there's, there's probably some substance in it. Uh, but I don't know the dark arts of espionage, you know, uh, who can hack what or who can who can do what. I think Putin's play the blinder, you know. Uh, I don't think Russia is a, is a rich country at the moment, but he, he controls it. Uh, why he wants to align himself to Donald Trump, nobody knows. But, yeah, I think I, th I think there's something in it, but I'm, I'm still sceptical. And, I, you know, I, I don't know this guy, Muller, uh, he was doing the investigation, but uh, he seems as though he's doing his own thing and he's, he's not being influenced by anybody. Now, Trump, one of the things uh, he's saying is that they have to uh, deal with China. The United States is declining economically in relationship to China. China is now making investments all over the world, particularly in ports, Piraeus and Greece and uh, other ports around the world, and uh, basically privatizing many ports. How do you see China's economic role internationally? Well, it's a juggernaut, you know, uh, China, it's over the last 15 years. I, I went there in 1989 on a ship to the Tianjin, and I think I've seen 10 cars, and the rest was, was bikes, people just cycling. And uh, I went back recently, and it's just totally, totally changed. But I think, you know, probably the state, they've got to manage a couple of billion people you know, uh, which is easier said than done. Uh, how they do it, you know, I don't really agree with because of the human rights uh, issues. You don't believe there's workers have democratic rights there? Not, not, not that I've seen, no. Uh, there's no unions, you know, I think there's some workers uh, uh, coordinated works councils, but it's just for show, I think, you know, just for the Nikes of this world. Uh, to say, yeah, we're, we're given decent standards when, you know, I, th I believe they're working in very dangerous environments. And how do you see the workers in the advanced capitalist countries linking up with uh, Chinese workers, which now are the largest workers force in the world? Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd, I'd welcome it. Uh, you know, I think it was Bob Crow who said, I've got more in common with a Chinese port worker than I have with a city banker in London. And you think that there are uh, opportunities for building links? I mean, there are uh, a lot of British investment, German investment, American investment in China, the same companies that unions are dealing with in the United States and Britain. Yes, yes, there should be union, unionized workplaces over there. The Prime Minister was over there last week. She came back with uh, 13 billion pounds worth of contracts. But, you know, uh, I'd like to see the detail. Uh, they probably don't want unions in those in those contracts. No, of course not. You know, un unions mean you know uh, better working practices, but usually that costs a bit more money. Uh, and these people are just asset strippers. You know, uh, profit uh, 
profit makers, you know, to, to the expense of ordinary people. What do you see the future of the labor movement? There is communication now, uh, the internet, cell phones, workers can get their stories out more and more. You, you see the uh, uh, growing internationalism of labor fighting to defend workers worldwide? Yeah, yeah, I, I welcome it. I'm not, you know, uh, a tech myself, but my children are, and I, I watch how they get their news and their information. So, yeah, as, as long as, you know, they can get on top of this fake news, uh, it's a problem, I think. But, you know, if, if you can get proper local news, uh, I think that, that might be a, a good thing. Okay, well, thank you for joining us on KPFA Workweek Radio. I appreciate uh, you, you giving me the time to express uh, the union's views.